Hello everyone, this is the fourth video in my series on the quantum harmonic oscillator. This video is going to be all about Rodriguez formula and Hermite polynomials, but I just wanted to start by giving you a very quick recap of what we've done in the first three videos. We started by rescaling our position and energy variables x and e uh, to become y and epsilon, as we've got defined at the top of the screen here. And those rescaled variables led to the uh, rescaled Schrodinger equation, differential equation that we've got at the top left, and we're trying to solve for the wave function phi as a function of y. The next we made an educated guess that the form of the wave function phi um, may be a polynomial p times e to the minus half y squared, and we showed that if phi is to have that form, then um, po the polynomial function p should satisfy that differential equation p double dash minus 2y p dash plus 2n p equals zero, where n is a natural number. Um, and in doing so, we also concluded that the energy is quantized. It can only take certain values, which are given by a natural number plus a half times h bar omega. And omega, remember, is a parameter that appears in the potential energy function itself. We had v as half m omega squared x squared. That was the quadratic potential that we started with. In the last video, we solved the differential equation that we've got for p using a power series. So we have sort of solved that, but in this video we're going to look at an alternative and actually in many cases more convenient way uh, of expressing the solutions for that differential equation for p. Now I'm going to start this by telling you the answer and we're going to spend most of the video proving that this is true. So I'm going to make a claim which is that p of y is proportional to e to the power of y squared times the nth derivative dn by dyn of e to the minus y squared. So this is what we're aiming to prove. Now because this is a bit of a strange looking expression, let's just take a moment to think about what it actually means. So if you think about e to the minus y squared, if you differentiate that once, you get minus 2y times e to the minus y squared. If you differentiate it again, you're going to get, from the product rule, you're going to get an extra term and you're going to end up with a polynomial function of y times e to the minus y squared. And you keep differentiating and differentiating, and using the product rule, you're going to end up with some polynomial times e to the minus y squared. So that's the nth derivative of e to the minus y squared. But then when you multiply all of that by e to the y squared in front here, that basically cancels out with the e to the minus y squared, and you're just left with a polynomial, right? So in spite of initial appearances, this expression that I've written down is actually just a polynomial function of y. So the way we're going to approach this proof is to build up that complicated looking expression bit by bit and we're going to start by introducing let's say let some function u of y uh, be defined as e to the minus y squared All right we're starting with that because that's the um the thing that we're differentiating n times in our proposed expression for p of y so we're going to try to find a second order differential equation which is obeyed by u Right, and the way to do that is just differentiate it to start with once. So we've got du by dy, as I said earlier, is minus 2y times e to the minus y squared, and I'm just going to write that as u. So du by dy is minus 2yu. Um, since we're aiming to prove uh, that our proposed p of y satisfies this differential equation over here, which has 0 on the right, let's just put all the terms on the same side and write that as du uh, by dy plus 2yu. Uh, is equal to zero. Now we're aiming to show that our function satisfies a second order differential equation, so let's differentiate a second time. Your first term is just going to give you d2u by dy squared, then you're going to have to use the product rule. On this 2yu, if you differentiate the y and leave the u, you get 2u. If you differentiate the u and leave the y, then you get plus 2y times du by dy, and that's all equal to zero. So now we've got a second order differential equation obeyed by e to the minus y squared. Now let's build it up one step further and find a second order differential equation obeyed by the nth derivative of e to the minus y squared. Now the way to do that is to take this differential equation that we've just derived and differentiate that n times. So let's just write down here what we're doing. We are going to apply dn, the operator dn by dy to the n. Um, and the problem with this, or the difficulty with this, is the first two terms are fairly straightforward, right? Differentiating those first two terms, uh, we just increase the order of the derivative, but then we've got to use the product rule on that third term, 2y du by dy. Now, the way to approach the nth derivative of a product is to use Leibniz's theorem. 
So I'm just going to write out Leibniz's theorem applied to the third term in our differential equation. I'm going to say use. So Leibniz's theorem says, if we want to take y du by dy, I'm leaving the two out for now because that doesn't really matter. So I'm going to take y du by dy and differentiate that n times. So shorthand, shorthand notation for that I'm going to use. Uh, this notation where you put a little n in brackets out there, meaning the nth derivative of the stuff in brackets. Uh, Leibniz's theorem tells us that you can express that as a sum over various orders of derivative. So we're going to sum where our index r goes from 0 up to n. You get a binomial coefficient, ncr. You get the rth derivative of y. And then you get, let me just write this out, you get the n minus rth derivative of du, du by dy, that's du by dy, and then derivative order n minus r up there. I'm not attempting to prove Leibniz's theorem here, so if you haven't seen this before, you might want to go and look up a proof. But for the purpose of this video, the important thing about this formula is that only a few of the terms, when we expand out that sum, only a few of them are actually non-zero. So if you think about the first term, which has r equals zero, well, nc0 for any value of n is just one. Then you get the zeroth order derivative of y, which means you don't differentiate at all. And so you just get a y from that first um, term. Then when r is zero, that's that last bit in our uh, sum is just the nth derivative of du by dy, right? And so you can write that nth derivative of du by dy as d by dy of dn u by dy to the power of n. This derivative bit here is the same as just the n plus oneth derivative of u, um, but I'm writing it deliberately in terms of the nth derivative because the formula that we're trying to prove has an nth derivative in it. So this is just going to be a little bit more useful. Now, what about the second term when we expand at the sum? Well, when r is 1, you get nc1 for any value of n. nc1 is just equal to n itself, so we get a factor of n there. Then you get the first derivative of y, which is just one, okay? And so we don't have to write anything down as our sort of middle bit there. Um, and then you're going to get the n minus oneth derivative of du by dy. And so that is the nth derivative, right? So dn u by dy to the power of n, um, because it was already differentiated once and you're differentiating it an additional n minus one time. So now that is an nth order derivative. Now, although this sum does go all the way up to n, all of the other terms are going to be zero, because if you were to differentiate your y term uh, more than once, right? So for example, if you had d2y by dy squared, that would be zero, right? Because the first derivative of y is already a constant, and so you differentiate it again, that goes to zero. So all of the remaining terms are actually zero. Now, having done that, we can return to the differential equation for u and just differentiate it n times. So our first term was d2u by dy squared. Um, I'm going to write that as the, the nth differentiated version of that. I'm going to write it as d2 by dy squared of dn u by dy to the power of n. Again, I'm deliberately separating out, separating out the nth order part from that additional 2. Um, the second term in our differential equation, 2u, is just going to give us 2 times the nth order derivative, so 2 dn u um, by dy to the n. And then for this last term, we just take all of the stuff that we got from Leibniz's theorem and multiply it by 2, because I didn't include the 2 there. And so you're going to get plus 2y times d by dy of dn u by dy to the n. I'm trying very hard here to make my u's and n's look different, so hopefully they're distinguishable. Anyway, uh, and then we get the second term of our Leibniz uh, expansion, which is 2n times dn u by dy to the n. And all of that stuff is supposed to be equal to 0. And notice that every term that I've written down in that differential equation contains a dn u by dy to the n. Right. So why don't we make a change of variables again and call that nth derivative v, because then we get a simpler looking differential equation which just says d2v by dy squared. Then we get, from this term over here, we get 2y dv by dy. So I'm going to write that in, 2 plus 2y dv by dy. And then I can collect together the second and fourth terms and factor out a 2 uh, to give me plus 2 
times n plus 1 times v, and all of that should be equal to 0. So just to emphasize that change of variables, I'm going to say where uh, v, which is a function of y, is the nth derivative of u, so dn u by dy to the n. And this is a good thing because we're getting closer to this expression that I originally wrote down um, up at the top here, because we've now got a differential equation obeyed by the nth derivative of e to the minus y squared. So, so far, we've made two changes of variable. We said u is e to the minus y squared, v is the nth derivative of that, and um, v has to satisfy this second order differential equation. Uh, so we've only got one more step now, really, which is to make one more variable transformation and introduce a new function w, which is e to the y squared v. Now, why is that a useful thing to do? Well, it's because e to the y squared v, if we write that purely in terms of y, it is e to the y squared times the nth derivative, dn by dy to the n, of e to the minus y squared, which is this thing that I said p was proportional to. So if we can show that w satisfies that original differential equation, then we will basically be done. So the way to show that this works is to write v in terms of w and then substitute it in place of the v's in our differential equation uh, on the previous line. So that means, so let's say all um, v is equal to e to the minus y squared w, right? That follows from the definition of w there. Then we've just got to differentiate that twice so that we can substitute it into our second order differential equation. So then first derivative, I'm just going to write it as v dash. Again, let's use the chain rule and the product rule. So we get minus 2y e to the minus y squared times w from differentiating the exponential. And then you get a plus e to the minus y squared w dash from differentiating the w. Um, for convenience, let's factor out the e to the minus y squared, which is present in both of those terms, e to the minus y squared. Um, and then you're going to get w dash minus uh, 2y w. Now it's a second order differential equation, so we have to differentiate once again. So v double dash, we're going to differentiate the expression that we got before. Um, using the product rule, first thing we're going to get is minus 2y e to the minus y squared. We leave the bracketed bit unchanged, w dash minus 2y w. Um, then we leave the exponential bit unchanged, so e to the minus y squared, and we differentiate the stuff in the brackets, which will give you w double dash, and then from differentiating the y, you get minus 2w, and from differentiating the w, you get minus 2y w dash. So let's collect as many terms together as we can. There is a common factor of e to the minus y squared in all of those terms. Let's take that out. You have a single um, second order derivative of w, so it's double, w double dash there. Um, right, now from the first term there, notice that you get a minus 2y times w dash. You have another minus 2y times w dash from the second term. So overall you have minus 4 of those, minus 4 uh, y w dash. What other types of term do we have? Well, we have minus 2y times minus 2y w, which is positive 4y squared w. We're not going to get any of those from the second bracket, so I'm just going to write down plus 4y uh, squared times w. And then I think the only remaining term that we haven't dealt with is this minus 2w here, so let's just put that, and then we can close our bracket. So that's, um, we've collected stuff together as much as we can. So the very last step in this proof, um, let's call that equation star. Remember, we already proved that v has to satisfy equation star. Um, so if we take that and substitute in um, our expression for v, which is e to the minus y squared w, and our expression for v dash, which is that stuff there, and our expression for v double dash, which is that stuff there, then we will find the second order differential equation, which is obeyed by w. Now, notice that uh, v... Um, it contains e to the minus y squared. V dash has the same term. V double dash also has the same term. So when I sub those in, the e to the minus y squared is just going to cancel out from all the terms, right? We can divide through by that because it's not zero. Um, and so I'm not even going to bother writing in that exponential term when I do the substitution. Right, so let's go ahead with the substitution. From the second order derivative, you get all of that stuff in the brackets there. So w double dash minus 4y w dash plus 4y squared w minus 2w, right? Your middle term 
in the differential equation that we're subbing into is 2y times the first derivative of v. Um, remembering that the first derivative of v um, contains the bracketed part, which is w dash minus 2yw. Putting all of that together, we are going to get plus 2yw dash, and then you're going to get minus 4y squared times w. Um, and then the final term in your differential equation is 2 times n plus 1 times v. The v just contributes this factor of w here. So I'm going to write down plus 2 times n plus 1 times w. And that should all be equal to 0. Some of these terms nicely cancel each other out. Notice that you've got a 4y squared w and a minus 4y squared w. They cancel each other out. Then you've got a minus 2w here. And you've got a plus 2w from this plus 1 in the brackets there. Those cancel. And you are left behind with the simplified differential equation w double dash minus 2y w dash. That's come from doing minus 4y w dash uh, plus 2y w dash. So you get minus 2 of those terms overall. Um, and then just plus 2n w is equal to 0. Now remembering that w itself, in terms of y, was that circles term there. Um, and so we've actually proved our result. I've put a proportionality sign when I first wrote this result for p of y up at the top. I've put that proportionality sign because, well, because the differential equation is linear, we can multiply our w by any constant and it will still satisfy the differential equation, right? So all we've proved um, is the solution is proportional to this, um, this term that we've written down. There is a convention for the constant of proportionality. So I'm just going to write down um, by convention, there's no reason why it has to be done this way, but the convention is um, to say that your polynomial is minus 1 to the power of n um, times that exponential and derivative stuff, right? e to the y squared dn by dy to the n times e to the minus y squared. So the constant of proportionality is conventionally taken to be minus 1 to the power of n. So it depends on, on n, but n is a fixed quantity for any particular version of this differential equation, right? The reason why we conventionally take that to be the constant of proportionality um, is basically because that guarantees that the coefficient of the highest power of y in that polynomial is always positive, right? You can check that yourself by actually just using the formula that we've derived or the formula that we've proved um, to work out the first few polynomials for the first few values of, uh, of n. And you'll find that if you don't have the minus 1 to the n, then the coefficient of the highest power of, uh, of y in those polynomials is, um, it alternates its sign. So you need this alternating minus 1 term, which flips between 1 and minus 1 and back and forth to make sure the coefficient of the highest term is positive. So the final word on terminology, uh, if you haven't, if you hadn't gathered from the title, uh, this formula here is called Rodriguez formula. It's a convenient way of getting these polynomials. And the polynomials that you get when you have your constant of proportionality being minus 1 to the n are called the Hermit polynomials. Um, and so this equation, well, for one thing, it just gives you a, uh, a nice way of, of deriving all the, the coefficients of your polynomials. But um, one of the reasons why this is more useful than the series solution that we derived in the last video is that it really helps when you're trying to normalize your wave functions um, in your, your quantum harmonic oscillator. So we'll see in the next and final video um, on the quantum harmonic oscillator how exactly that works. So thanks for watching and see you again soon.